All right, you headbanging scallywags. It is time to weigh anchor air and prepare to set sail for the story of one of my top five favorite heavy metal bands of all time. That's right. Tonight, we're going deep down to Davy Jones' locker to talk about the indomitable Running Wild. This is a band that has never got its due, especially in the United States. Overseas, they've had a good fan base, but they never got over in the U.S. And so tonight, I want to show you more Running Wild albums than you probably ever wanted to see. And I promise I'll try to keep the pirate jokes to a minimum. Arr. Okay, why do an entire video about Running Wild other than the fact that, yes, they've always been one of my favorite heavy metal bands. Their consistency over time, uh, just great albums in and out. Lead Man Rockin' Ralph is one of those guys who should be an iconic figure for heavy metal. His ability to just consistently turn out riffs. He's got that great, gruff, leathery voice. Um, I think that covers it pretty well, why I should spend some time talking about Running Wild. As a matter of fact, this was the idea I had for my very first video, when Marty over at Marty Worm and Autumn over at This Machine Kills Music were first, you know, sort of poking me to start doing some videos and start my own channel. It's like, uh, what would I talk about? The first idea I had is like, Running Wild, why wouldn't I? So, it's time to finally get that boat out in the water and see what we can do with it. So, Running Wild story began in the late 70s. They take their name, of course, from a classic Judas Priest song. And you can hear a lot of Judas Priest influence in uh, early Running Wild material. They demoed for a bit, kind of got their sound sort of worked out. And so from like around yeah, the very early 80s, up to around 83, there's demo materials to working out some songs. Uh, so let's start showing some records as we tell this pirate tale. Uh, this is a boot that has some live recordings from June 83 on it. And sound quality is not the greatest, uh, being a bootleg, of course. It has some unreleased tracks that never made it onto later albums. But again, it shows the band sort of, you know, working out the kinks and getting things there. Uh, they finally started to get a break as they were signed to Noise Records. Uh, now, the history of this is told in some detail in the book, Damn the Machine, the history of noise records. Really good read for folks that are into that German heavy metal scene from the 1980s. Uh, there's a lot of commentary in here from most of the major bands uh, that were on the label, and a lot of interviews done with the owner of the label as well. There's always been a lot of contention back and forth between him and some of the bands, so it's kind of interesting to hear both sides of that argument later on. But yeah, Running Wild would be one of the early sort of acquisitions by Noise. What they did with the early part of their catalog was put out a couple of compilation albums. It gave each band a chance to do one or two songs, and then would judge feedback from the heavy metal writers and fans of the day to see which bands they should offer a contract to and which ones you know, maybe not to bother with so much. So, Running Wild shows up on one of the first uh, things released under the Noise banner, the Rock From Hell compilation. And again, they got two songs. They show up here playing Chains and Leather, which is a well-known staple, and also their classic Adrian track. Uh, definitely the strongest material on this compilation. While it's, you know, got sort of, you know, cool, stereotypical heavy metal cover, overall there's not a lot to write home about here. Other than Running Wild, you get uh, early appearance by a Gravedigger, another one of those very early noise bands. But beyond that, you have uh, Sado, who is one of Noise's missteps, their attempt to kind of hire a more uh, sort of glam, sleaze, more commercial-leaning type band. Uh, you get a couple of tracks from Railway. Sometimes I listen to the Railway albums and think they're great. And other times I listen to them and I wonder why I'm not listening to a better German heavy metal album. So kind of back and forth on those. Iron Force doesn't make much of an impression and neither does Rated X. So it's a nice early piece of the label's history and Run and Wild's history. But yeah, not the strongest track lineup overall, to be honest. It's not the only compilation that Running Wild got a slot on. They also got featured on Noise's death metal compilation. Uh, this is one that's better known. It's notorious first off for having a cover art that ended up getting banned in some territories. 
the zombie eating stuff by today's standard is like, oh, isn't that cute? For 1983, yeah, this got the ban hammer dropped on it in some countries. And so you'll see some copies of this later on with very plain cover artwork. Uh, I think they even put a sticker on it or something that said, you know, hey, cover is so gross it got banned in Germany and places like that. Uh, the comp's not just known for the controversial cover, however, it's also known because it's got some really good tracks by several big name bands on it. Uh, this is where you get Hellhammer uh, contributing a couple of tracks. You have, going to move it this way, a couple of tracks from Running Wild. And these tracks, unlike the ones on Rock From Hell, these two tracks were hard to track down anywhere else for a long time. So this was the only way to hear these two Running Wild tracks for a long time. You also get early Halloween material uh, and an unreleased Halloween song that didn't show up until it was a bonus track on a reissue much, much later. And then you also have Dark Avenger. I got nothing against Dark Avenger, but you know, you've already had three major hits. Uh, somebody's going to fail to make the cut, and Dark Avenger didn't have a whole lot of output after this. But so again, Running Wild got another chance to show their stuff. Um, they obviously made the cut, and always picked them up for further releases. But one of the first things the band would put out under just the Running Wild tag, getting off the compilation train finally, was a three-track EP. Uh, this one's known as the Adrian EP or Victim of State's Power. It's got three tracks on it. So you've got, let's see, Victim of State's Power, Walpurgis Night, and Satan are the three tracks on it. Um, this copy's got a bunch of old noise flyers in it with um, t-shirt order forms and Stuff like that, always kind of cool to see what they were doing. Even early on at Noise, they were getting the merchandise cranked out. Uh, you get the classic Running Wild Adrian mascot showing up there as well. The, this would lead straight into the band's first full-length album. And now it's time to switch over to CDs for the rest of this. All the Running Wild vinyl I have is their very, very early stuff. As soon as they started making albums, I've got uh, the rest of their discography, or most of it, just on CDs. So then we get to the EP, comes out in like early 84, and their first album, Gates to Purgatory, also comes out uh, later in 84. And this shows the band to, again, be operating. There's still a lot of that clear Judas Priest worship going on. Um, the band was sometimes described as being kind of satanic. There's nothing particularly, you know, satanic about the lyrics or anything. It's just that every now and then they would, you know, mention something slightly dark, you know, like, you know, uh, having a song called Satan or, you know, Adrian, son of Satan, uh, things like that. So I always felt like the, you know, quote unquote, black metal tag was a little overplayed with early Running Wild for the most part. They're operating in, you know, sort of standard Judas Priest territory. The lyrics just have, you know, a slightly sort of, you know, darker lyrical theme, but still kind of mild. Felt like, you know, another German band that got kind of unfairly pegged that way was Iron Angel. Um, and early Running Wild's kind of in that same boat. But even here on their first album, while it's kind of a simple, straightforward affair, it still has lots of really good tracks on it. Uh, the classic that was kind of, you know, part of their set list for ages is Closer Prisoner of Our Time, which is one of their sort of, you know, political, raise your fist, stick it to the man kind of things, which always goes down a storm with a heavy metal crowd, but it is a great track. You also have Genghis Khan, which is a little uh, more restrained, but a very good, shows a little more flair for the epic, which is something the band would develop over time. Uh, if Preacher is a really cool song. Uh, Preacher was the nickname for their guitarist on a lot of this early material, and this is his only appearance on an album. So yeah, Gates to Purgatory, very solid start for the band. It, I feel like it sometimes gets overlooked as you go through the rest of their catalog, just because there's a lot of quality stuff in it. But it's an album that still you can go back to and enjoy a lot. So next year, they would crank out another album, 
a lot of bands on noise were encouraged to keep, you know, putting out the albums at a rate of about one per year. And Running Wild stuck pretty close to that. So album number two, you have Branded and Exiled. This one doesn't stray too far from the style of Gates to Purgatory. You're still doing this very straightforward, uh, classic German heavy metal sound, still with this slightly dark lyrics here and there, but again, don't overblow that. A couple of things are noteworthy about this album, making it sound a little different from Gates. Uh, this is the first appearance of guitarist Moti, who was in the band for several of their classic 80s albums. Other thing about this is it has a very odd production. It almost sounds kind of very cavernous, like it's recorded in this very large area. Um, almost makes it sound like it's recorded underground or something a little bit. I mean, you can hear the music, but it's just got this weird uh, sound to it. It's not a good production, but it actually kind of works for the music here. It kind of helps give it that just you know, a little bit more of a menacing feel. So uh, it clicks really good for some of the tracks. Uh, you've got classics like Branded and Exiled on it. You've got, let's see, Realm of Shade. It's one of the good tracks on here. It's got a really kind of creepy, evil guitar tone to it. really like that. Chains and Leather make its appearance here, and that is very clearly a throwback to Judas Priest's take on all the world. So again, they're still wearing their influences on their sleeve a bit with this album. And again, solid album, like it a lot. It's just that these first two Judas Priest albums, or sorry, <laughs> there you go. These first two Running Wild albums are very different from what would come later on. Now you have some people that love these first two, and they don't really get into anything after this point. But the band's legacy really lies in what happens beyond this point. Notice I haven't mentioned the word pirate so far. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There's no traces of all the you know, piracy stuff. That gimmick is not on these first two albums or early recordings whatsoever. So what changed? Well, the band was touring in between around after this album, around 1986. They did a tour that came into North America. It was one of their only uh, North American tours. They were on a weird bill with Celtic Frost and I believe it was Creator. And obviously they're kind of the odd man out in that scenario. You've got, you know, two bands that are playing, you know, uh, you know very heavy thrash, Celtic Frost, you know, at the time doing, you know, uh, sort of, you know, their death metal material. And Running Wild, again, is operating more like Judas Priest kind of territory. And to make it worse, you know, they were sort of being hyped as like the heaviest band in the world. But they're opening for, again, Creator and Celtic Frost. You can imagine that didn't go over well with the audience. And, you know, sort of the fallout from that tour was Running Wild avoided North America for pretty much the rest of their career. And I was like, eh, this isn't the place for us. And so they would stick more to Europe and do a little bit of work in Japan and stuff like that. And so 1986, they didn't get an album out. They kind of you know, went back to Germany, licked their wounds a little bit, and tried to figure out what to do going forward. And something else they comment on in that Damn the Machine book is that Walter really kind of encouraged the bands to develop some kind of unique image. You know, that you needed something to make yourself stand out a little bit. Because even by then, heavy metal was rapidly becoming a pretty crowded scene. And you didn't want to be just, you know, another bunch of guys wearing, you know, denim and leather. Well, you and a hundred other bands are doing that. And so Ralph got it in his head to start playing with uh, some historical work on pirates. And so in 1987, they included uh, some stuff on the next album, album number three, Under Jelly Roger. This is the album that really started to set them apart and where they really uh, started to come into their own. Very good album. Holds up quite well, even though compared to some of the later ones, it uh, still sounds a little bit early. You might think of this as a transition album. They're starting to move away from that uh, Judas Priest style of metal and getting their own thing going. The title track is the classic, Under Jolly Roger. Most folks have heard this track at some point. It's got, you know, the great intro with the cannons going off. It goes right into the rolling drum beat. 
it showcases you know a speedier almost kind of trim a little picking style of guitar work that works really well it's something they would perfect on a lot of their speed metal anthems over the years the album benefits from a very sort of uh, crackly production. It gives it a lot of energy, uh, kind of adds a little bit of tension to the music. Uh, sounds like it's really just waiting to kind of pop right out of your speakers and just go nuts on you. A lot of good songs on here besides just the title track, though. You also have Diamonds of the Black Chest, which is, again, just a really good racing track. Uh, you've got Raise Your Fist, good anthemic number. Running Wild always keeps those, you know, in their catalog. Uh, Raw, uh, Raw uh, Ride, I'll get it out here in a minute. Some others. A few of the tracks fall a little, not bad, but a little average. So they're still getting their sea legs. Pirate joke time. Uh, but yeah, it's a very solid album, and You know, really set the stage for better things to come. So after the success of Under Jolly Roger, they figured, okay, pirates. People seem to like pirates. And again, some in like the metal press and all were writing it off as being kind of cheesy or hokey. And they're like, you know what? Screw it. It's fun. We kind of like it. It got a good reaction from fans. So let's take that parrot and run with it. And they would run into it uh, with the album the next year, 1988's Port Royal. Uh, Port Royal, this was my first introduction to Running Wild. Uh, didn't pick this up until like the mid-90s. They were a band I always heard about through the late 80s and early 90s, and I just couldn't find any of their stuff. Their albums were always notoriously hard to get in the U.S. Again, noise didn't really push them in this territory much because of the fallout from that disastrous 1986 tour. But Port Royal, you can tell right away from the cover, they're embracing their pirate alter egos at this point. Uh, this album has some magnificent songs on it, Conquistadors. It's the opening song on side two, if you have it on vinyl or cassette. And again, it's just got this beautiful kind of fast and furious tremolo picking in the guitar solo. Instantly just grabs you. You will never forget that riffage as long as you live. Great song. They're still doing some of the kind of protest songs that go back to victim of state's power and such, but now they're working them into this historical content. You know, Conquistadors is very much like that. It's more a song about sort of, you know, um, you know looking at the church and some of, you know, the horrible things they did as they came to the new world and, you know, started to take over people. If there's a theme to running wild overall, it's freedom. And whether it's, you know, freedom from political oppression, church oppression, or just, you know, being free to ride a Harley or get on a great big boat and sail the seven seas. And there's always that theme in their music, even if they just put it into different types of songs. But yeah, a lot of excellent songs on here. This is a very solid album start to finish. This one doesn't get mentioned an awful lot when folks discuss Running Wild, and I think it's just that it gets overshadowed by the album that comes after this one. So, after 1988's album, they get to 1989, and this is when the band releases one of their real watershed moments in their catalog, Death or Glory. They now have the piracy theme down to a science, and they are expanding it, and they're speeding up even faster. Uh, the intro to this, they're really getting the epic sway of things down quite a bit. They can rival Halloween when it comes to the epic vibe for power speed metal being released around this time. This being you know, uh, right after you know, Halloween's done their Keepers albums and Running Wild is on there. They don't sound like Halloween. Again, the band's a little more straightforward, but they're, and they're still doing this, you know, speedy Germanic power metal as good as anybody else on the planet at this stage. Uh, tons of great tracks with Tortuga Bay and things like that. Not the best cover art. I never did like the image for it. Um, they're not always dressing as pirates. They know, still know how to just, you know, throw on the leather for the band photo as well. But yeah, this is the album. If someone has heard a Running Wild album, this is probably the one they've checked out. Uh, it seems to have gotten the best press, the best reviews, and gotten the most attention in their back catalog. So, yeah, cannot emphasize enough what an excellent album this is. If you like power speed metal, that European flavor to it, you need to hear this. 
All right. Well, the band would skip albums in 1990. They had a lot of EPs and things like that come out around this time. Again, the reaction to Death or Glory was really strong. And so they wouldn't get the next album out. I'm pretty sure there was a one-year gap. Just checking my notes over here. Yeah, so they skipped 1990 and get their next album out in 1991. Uh, and that's when they released Blazing Stone, which is this album. Some things happen around this time. Now, first off, this is a very good album, and it's a very solid follow-up to Death or Glory. There's nothing wrong with this album. But by 1991, the musical scene was, of course, changing quite a bit. In 1991, you see the release of Metallica's Black Album, and Pearl Jam's 10, and Nirvana's Nevermind. You start to see a lot of your thrash bands kind of starting to fade into the black ground, or changing their style into something that wasn't as interesting to a lot of their older fans. So the music scene's going through some weird transitions at the time. Halloween has been locked up in lawsuits with noise records for a couple of years at this point. They're unable to release any follow-up and really capitalize on the momentum from the Keepers era. And so it's a weird time for bands in that power metal styling. A lot of folks are kind of moving away from that at this point. Um, you know, death metal is the darling of the heavy metal scene in 1991. And so amidst all this, Running Wild releases another very good album, but I feel like it went a bit overlooked, and I feel like it still does to this day. A couple of things to note with this album. It's the last one that guitarist Modi plays on. So after this, the lineup starts to become more unstable. Uh, they still have good musicians involved, but this is kind of, you know, the end of an era where they had, you know, some really top-notch guitarist in Modi. Another issue with this album is that it's way too freaking long. Uh, even discounting the bonus tracks, you've got, I believe, 13 songs on this one, and it's just too long. Um, if they had trimmed maybe three of the average tracks off of this. I released an album with like, you know, nine or 10 real stone cold killers. And there are some great ones on here. The album might have, you know, got a little stronger reaction, a uh, little more attention. Uh, it still has great stuff on it. Little Bighorn is one of their best tracks they ever did. It's got Billy the Kid, which I like a lot. Blazing Stone itself is an excellent track. Lone Wolf is one of their really good tracks. I always think Lone Wolf is on one of the al other albums for some reason, but nah, it's another quality track here. White Mask uh, has an excellent chorus, a really strong track as well. So yeah, it's really good. It's just, it feels like, yeah, they needed to hit the stop button a few songs earlier in the studio, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it's one that definitely deserves more credit than it gets sometimes. Now, even though the musical scene was changing, uh, it was full steam ahead, you know, ship ahoy, pirates keep on being pirates, and Running Wild would be back in 1992 with another album called Pile of Skulls. This is the point where, again, I feel like Running Wild really wasn't getting much attention anymore outside of Europe. The musical currents had shifted enough that any kind of power metal or even traditional metal in general was dying a quick death in the United States. And in around 92, Halford's out of Priest. Dickinson's out of Iron Maiden. Um, yeah, you know, Sabotage has moved on into rock opera territory and doing a very different style. You didn't have a lot of bands championing the cause for classic heavy metal like this in the United States. And Running Wild didn't have a big following in the U.S. to begin with, so they just stuck to Europe and kept doing what they did best. Pile of Skulls. So again, new lineup, and this would sort of usher in an era where the lineup would start to rotate uh, more quickly. Ralph has developed a reputation over the years as not being the easiest guy to work with, uh, having a pretty healthy ego, some would say. Whether that's the cause for it or whether he just wanted to work with different musicians, I don't know, and it doesn't matter, because they kept putting out quality albums. 
Palace Calls is another one that there's too many songs on. Um, they needed to trim back the list a little bit, even leaving off the bonus tracks at the end. It's a long album to get through. The album has, at times, the drum sound is very bad on this. Uh, this is one of those first times where people start to kind of question whether Ralph was using a drum machine more often than not. It's something he denies, uh, and I'm not going to question him on it, but the drumming, for example, opening track Whirlwind is a really good track, except it has this just very static, staccato, repetitive, simple drum sound in it that if that's a human drummer. Well, he found a beat and he stuck to it. I'll tell you that. So the album has uh, a couple of good tracks early, um, but it, side A on this, again, if you're listening to it on vinyl or cassette, the first side is a little up and down. A couple of good songs, a couple of average songs, such. But when you get to the middle, starting around track six, uh, they really just start firing on all eight and have excellent tracks on here. Things like Jennings' Revenge, uh, Pile of Skulls, the title track, is absolutely awesome. One of the real interesting things on here is that the band puts forth uh, the closer is this kind of long, epic, you know, 10 minute track. And it's one of the best. It's Treasure Island. And if there was ever a song this band was meant to write and play, it's that one. It's got a great sort of little spoken intro part with Ralph screaming, Pieces of Eight! Pieces of Eight! Ha ha ha! And, uh, kind of setting the tone for the story from Treasure Island, of course. The chorus is just fantastic. It crawls in your head and stays there for days. Um, it is an epic pirate tale. This is an epic pirate band. It's, it was meant to be, absolutely. They had played with doing some longer sort of epic story songs a little bit earlier, even back on Port Royal. They had, uh, I think it's William the Kid. Um, and it works okay, but they just nail it right here. You know, lots of bands try to do that where they have one big long song on the album. Now let's face it, a lot of times it's a little bit boring, but it's one of the highlights on this album and one of the highlights of their career. So despite, you know, a few little issues with the record, they're still firing and peak performance here. This is an excellent album, should not go overlooked. So what do they do? Uh, they keep churning right along. So by, they'd skip 1993 for release, 94, they would come out with new lineup, new album, Black Hand In. This is arguably the best album they ever made, and it's arguably one of the best power speed metal records to ever come out of Germany. And if you know your German metal, you know I'm making a statement there. And the album backs it up. Uh, this thing is freaking amazing. It has some missteps in the track list. Uh, once again, they could have trimmed one or two songs and made it a much tighter, stronger album. Uh, the velocity they play some of this stuff at with just this hyper speed tremolo picking, especially in tracks like Black Hand In, is just insane. It's really, really incredible stuff. There's kind of a loose story going on about, you know, pirate having been burned at the stake, you know, ages ago for witchcraft, and the site where he's burnt out later is, you know, this mysterious stranger turns up and seems to have mystical powers and stuff. Uh, it's a loose theme for some of the songs. It works just fine. It's fun. Nothing wrong with it. But yeah, uh, Powder and Iron, uh, Phantom of Black Hand, and the Privateer, Roll of the Privateer. Excellent stuff here. Um, if you like any Running Wild and you've never heard this one, this is the one to give a chance. They take another stab at doing a long epic closer with, uh, what is that one called? Genesis? And it's kind of an odd little side note in the band's history. It's okay. It's not Treasure Island caliber whatsoever. Rather than having a pirate theme or a historical topic theme, it's this weird story about aliens coming to Earth in the distant past to mine for gold, because I guess aliens need gold for something, 
and in the process they create human beings and so it's kind of this like weird alternate take on the genesis story from the bible but with aliens and pirates and gold and stuff um the band never really ventured back into sci-fi waters like this again so it's interesting i consider it a little bit of a miss but it's also kind of cool that they gave something else a little bit of a try rather than just you know, going right back and doing another big 10-minute epic about a different pirate or a different pirate story. Uh, again, they just kept the hammer down in 1995. Uh, same lineup as Black Hand Inn that delivers another crushing power speed album in Masquerade. This one got some mixed reviews. The production put some folks off. Uh, it's not the cleanest production job, but doesn't bother me too much personally. But again, just blistering speed, insanely catchy choruses, uh, great track, Soleil Royale is on here, and it's one of my favorite songs the band ever did. The title track, Masquerade, they always turn in a quality title track on these albums. Um, you have lots of good stuff on here. Lions of the Sea is the anthemic, slower, gets everybody's hands and horns up in the air uh, type number. So they just kept going from strength to strength to strength. The problem was, again, they're doing it in the, er, in like the late 80s and into the early and mid 90s when nobody outside of Europe is paying any attention to this style of metal. Uh, the only band that really could rival them during this time period was Blind Guardian. Blind Guardian was also, you know, in their classic run of albums around this stretch with Tales from the Twilight World and Somewhere Far Beyond and such. And most of the world just didn't give a crap because we were all stuck listening to Pantera and Biohazard and 50,000 bands that wanted to sound exactly like Cannibal Corpse. I'm sure you can sense my enthusiasm for such acts. But yeah, there's some great stuff that was going on in Germany, uh, but the band wasn't getting a lot of recognition for it because it's at the wrong time. All right, well... What do you do then? You just put out another damn good album. That's what you do. Uh, you get to 1998. So now there's a little bit of a gap here as you get to the rivalry. This is where the band is now parted ways with Noise Records and move over to the gun label. Rivalry gets overlooked a little bit because, again, you just had this massive string of really good albums. Now you've switched labels. It's been a couple of years. Uh, even I sometimes tend to think of this one and say, mm, yeah, I guess that one's okay. And then I play it again. I'm just like, oh, man, I, yeah, my, my bad. This isn't just okay. This is really, really good. Uh, they carry on with lots of good stuff. Again, the title track, The Rivalry, is just instant classic material. Um, Ballad of William Kidd is on here, is another good one. Kiss of Death is really good. Fire Breather, uh, just awesome stuff, track after track after track. Now, I will say this is the album where they start to have a few more missteps in the track list. It's not just that they have too many songs, but some of the songs are starting to feel a little bit flat. Um, right in the middle, you've got Return of the Dragon, which doesn't really ever go anywhere. Um, it's The bad are definitely outweighed by the good. It's a real solid album. But you start to maybe see a few cracks in the armor. Wait, pirates don't wear armor. Uh, you're starting to see a few termites in the peg leg. That's probably stretching it a bit, but it's late, and I've been doing this for over 30 minutes already. So, yeah, anyway. The Rivalry, I would say, is the last really good album they would do for a long time. So this is kind of the end of the era here. They got one good album, one gun. But after this, things take a weird turn. And it's funny, because in terms of the timeline, this is the point in time where power metal finally starts to make its comeback. You had Hammerfall's Glory to the Brave come out in, I believe, like early 97. And it just reopened everyone's eyes like oh power metal still exists you still have bands that play that yeah we want to hear that again when again two or three years before you couldn't give that stuff away anywhere outside of you know some european countries and so right as uh hammerfall is 
really taking the world by storm and bands like Rhapsody and Blind Guardian and Stradivarius start to really reap the benefit of that and raise their visibility, Running Wild starts to lose the plot. So you get to, I believe it's 2000 for this next one. Yeah, 2000 they released their next album, Victory. Now, one thing you'll notice is since we've moved over to Gun Records, the graphics and the visuals are looking a little less and less impressive. Big flag on a big checkerboard. Um, pretty sure somebody put this together in Windows 95 Paint. Um, not much happening there. Again, lineup questions abound uh, here. Lineup is not very stable. I don't think you can get pictures of anybody except Ralph, and you get Ralph wearing not a pirate uniform, but um, I don't know, the 1818 Northwest German Pro Football Marching Band uniform. Say this, you got to be pretty darn confident in your masculinity to let people take pictures of you wearing that and put it in an album. Musically, this album is pretty spotty. Hate to say it, but yeah. A um, lot of average tracks here. There's no velocity to this album. Ralph is, at this point, really kind of given up on the speed metal side of things and almost gone back to like the sort of accept and Judas Priest formula. There's a lot more just straightforward, mid-tempo, 4-4 four, four time signature type songs. There's not a lot of bad songs on the album. There's just not a lot of good songs. Uh, there's a couple. When Time Runs Out, I like. The Guardian is pretty good. Um, but yeah, there's other stuff. The um, opening song, The Fall of Dorcas, it's got this kind of just weird mid-paced marching beat to it. It does not catch fire the way most uh, Running Wild openers are. Another thing that's very strange in the track list on this, right in the middle at track five, there's a cover song. Running Wild, there's two things they never did. They never wasted much time with cover songs. They did do an excellent cover of Thin Lizzy's Genocide back on Blazing Stone. But um, right here in the middle, they never did cover songs, they never did ballads. Well, there's no ballad here, but you have track five, cover version of the Beatles' Revolution. Just want to let that sink in for a minute. Uh, Beatles, great, inspirational, best thing since sliced toast. Okay, I hate the Beatles. I hate the Beatles with a fiery, deep-burning passion. I, I don't care that the most innovative thing ever and that, you know, John Lennon sits upon the left-hand throne of, you know, the muse of music. I despise the Beatles. I would be quite happy if I never heard another Beatles song for the rest of my life. It's just me. I know I'm in the minority. If you like them, cool. No problem. I detest the Beatles. And all of a sudden, my favorite power speed band is paying tribute to the Beatles, right in the middle of an album. Sad. So anyway, you get an album that, eh, at the end of the day, if I'm being honest, it's not a very good album. I have a little bit of a soft spot for it. There's just enough good stuff here that I can take it out and listen to it and think, eh, it's not quite as bad as everyone claims. I also kind of like this one because I found it in a Camelot music store of all places. It's the only time I have ever found a Running Wild album in a, you know, like, sort of, you know, chain, big name record store thing. So I was happy to get it at the time. You take it home and you play it, and you're like, well, yeah, that's, that's a Running Wild album. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't get much better from here. Uh, next album is 2002's The Brotherhood. Gotta love that big budget gun was putting into their cover art. Um... This album, if you give me a minute, I'll find a good track. Most of the material here, though, is just kind of plain and boring. Ralph, again, he's sticking to that very straightforward, mid-paced material. And long gone are the days of those hyper-speed tremolo picks and the big, epic, soaring choruses and stuff. Instead, you get tracks like Detonator, which has this very sort of staccato chorus where they just keep saying detonator and it's just like can i walk the plank now because i've had about enough 
However, there is one winner in the track list and it's buried right in the middle, track five, Siberian Winter. Siberian Winter sounds like it's left over from the Black Hand Inn days. Uh, all of a sudden the speed and the flurry of guitar notes and the majesty is back. And it's an instrumental, he doesn't even sing on it, but uh, it's a glorious song. And it kind of pisses me off a little bit, to be honest, because the shows that Ralph was still able and willing to write music of that caliber at this point. So it's not that he had forgotten how or that his current lineup couldn't pull it off. They could do it, and they could do it really well. And so it begs the question, what the hell's with all these other songs on here? Why don't they sound like Siberian Winter? I just don't get it. Uh, you know, just another little point. One of the songs on here that's decent is um, track seven, Pirate Song. It's the, well, pirate song for the album. But they don't even really bother to give it a real name. They just call it Pirate Song. It's like bouncing along to the pirate song. Da, 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 da. It's barely three minutes long. Um, it's like, so it's almost, in a way, like they're parodying themselves. It's like, yeah, okay, here's your freaking pirate song. Hurrah. Listen to the detonator again. No, that's not what Running Wild, Running Wild didn't, that's not what we want to hear. Uh, so yeah, Brotherhood, this album, you can pass on. A couple, again, Siberian Winter is worth the price of admission. But for the rest of the songs, you're going to want your money back. Okay, what happens after that? Well, notice I'm still showing albums. They've got a deep catalog, and I've got most of them. A few years off, they come back in 2005 with Rogues in Vogue. Um, this album, I liked it when it came out, because if nothing else, it had a spark of energy about it. You had some songs trying to pick up the tempo a little bit once again. Um, over time, it hasn't aged that well. There's not a lot of classics on here necessarily, but again, it's got at least a little bit of oomph to it. After the very flat victory and brotherhood, it feels like, yeah, they actually feel, they sound enthusiastic and excited about playing again. Production, however, doesn't help this any. Uh, it's starting to sound very computerized. <clears throat> Ralph's guitar tone sounds really kind of like almost cheap. It's almost like he's playing a toy guitar or something. And this is a man who's written some of the best riffage. It's like he can write riffs in his sleep. So I don't get why they're starting to use this really rinky-dink guitar sound. Uh, it's, again, just very out of place for a band like this. So not, not a terrible album, better than the past couple of efforts, but uh, not one that you have to visit unless you're, you know, a real fanboy like yours truly. So what happens after that? Uh, here's where there's a break for a while. Um, you know, the band announces their retirement, does their you know farewell shows and all that. And of course it takes them less than a couple of years to get right back in the studio. And in 2012, so it's a seven year break, they release an album called Shadow Maker. You'll notice I'm not holding up a copy of Shadow Maker right now. Shadowmaker is the one that even I decided, you know what, I could have the complete Running Wild discography, but I would have to buy a copy of Shadowmaker. And I'm not going to buy a copy of that album because it sucks so bad. Um, the cover graphics, again, just look horrible. It looks like the emblem off of a Decepticon or a Transformer or something. Horrible, horrible uh, graphics. And the music is just awful. They're not only playing you know, this very worn out, you know, except Judas Priest standard metal sound. I like accepting Judas Priest, don't get me wrong. But, you know, at this point, Rolf's playing a carbon copy of that kind of stuff and he's doing it you know, like 35 years after the fact. That, that, that don't work. That don't work well at all. There is nothing good about Shadowmaker. Um, a, I even thought, well, you know, do I want to download the album, just have the songs on MP3 for the collection? It cost about three or four bucks to buy that as a download purchase. I could do a lot of things with three or four bucks that don't involve paying for an album I absolutely 
don't like in any way, shape, or form, I think I will spend those three or four bucks buying M&Ms. My tummy will be happy for a little while, and I won't have to look at Shadow Maker on my hard drive. I don't have it, and I never will. Horrible album. That This is really rock bottom for Rolf and Running Wild. They would release another album the very next year, 2013. It's Resilient. Notice I'm not holding up a copy of Resilient either. It's better than Shadow Maker. But then again, some Beatles records might be better than Shadow Maker. Coming from me, that's saying something. I think I made my feelings clear about John Lennon's former mob a little bit earlier. Uh, Resilient, it's still the same thing. The band is out of ideas. They are out of gas. Um, it's time to just pull into dock. Uh, go find the nearest tavern. Put up your peg leg and call it a day. Might as well get in a few more pirate jokes here as I can. And look like that's what they would do. Um, and then in 2016, three years later, there's word that another Running Wild album is coming out. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh, dear God, j just please stop embarrassing yourselves. Um, this, no, you haven't made a good, a really good album now since, you know, the turn of the century. Um, and, but no, 2016, they put out an album called Rapid Foray. This album. <sighs> what to say about Rapid Foray? It's a good album. They kind of got their groove back. Um, now, it's not in the same league as their classics. It's no Black Hand In or Death or Glory. And the album is derivative of a lot of their older material, but it's derivative of their good older material. You know, some of the tracks on here sound very, very much like, you know, they've copied some riffs and ideas out of Pile of Skulls, for example. But hey, that's what I want to hear this band do. Yeah, uh, go back and play that stuff. And they did. So they actually pulled it off and hoist the sail and get back out to sea one more time. So yeah. Decent album. I, I did not buy this blind. Uh, I was like, no, we're going to check that out online before <laughs> I pay money for Running Wild these days. And I bought, I listened to it, and it was just like, damn, now I got to start buying Running Wild albums again. And now there's a gap in the discography, which I'm not filling in. Not going to do it. Not going back and getting those last two. But maybe this starts a new chapter for the band. Um, if all they're going to do is sort of pay homage to their classic period with some songs that are, in a way, almost rewrites of what they've done before, I'm okay with that. Uh, we've been hearing, you know, bands like Blazing Stone do that for a while. Blazing Stone is a, you know, blatant running wild tribute band, and they're great at it, and I like them. I probably should have some Blazing Stone CDs sitting here to show you, but the video's long, and I'm not going to stop and go find them right now. If I've got a gripe about this album, it's the fact that it shows that sometimes, once in a while, those old bands who are, seem over the hill and they've been done for a long time, every now and then they do recapture a little bit of the magic. And it makes you feel pressured to check out those albums when somebody gets the band back together and you're like, ah, oh, there's no way they're doing anything good these days. Couldn't possibly be worth listening to. Uh, but Running Wild pulled it off with uh, Rapid Foray. Maybe I should listen to that new, you know, fill in the blank, you know, reunion project. Most of them don't do a lot of quality material, but because this came out and because this is good, I once again start feeling compelled to check out the comeback albums from all these other bands. Nine times out of 10, they're horrible and I want that hour of my life back. If this had been bad, I wouldn't feel compelled to check out so many of those reunion projects as I do. So what does the future hold for Running Wild? Don't know. It's been four years. There's no follow-up album yet. Looks like they've got an EP, but it's just a couple of cover tracks that came out last year. Not really much original material to it. And so we finally come to the end. And this is the longest video I've done so far. I knew it would take a while to get through the Running Wild catalog. But let me... Uh, take a break and now let's talk metal in the comments down below what's your favorite era for running wild do you only like the early stuff uh do you love the pirate street stuff is the pirate theme too hokey for you that's right what's your favorite album favorite songs you notice i didn't mention much live running wild material do you have one last thing i'll show off 
Um, again, Ray Wilds never had the reputation as an insanely great live band, but there are some live recordings out there. This is one of the early bootlegs that's kind of infamous called Black Demons on Stage, and it's recorded during the Branded and Exiled era. Uh, they also had a live album come out around the Death or Glory time called Ready for Boarding, uh, and there's some other unofficial releases here and there. I've heard one or two of them at times, and uh, again, don't feel like they quite capture it as well live as they do on the studio stuff. But yes, if you're into German metal, power speed metal, and you haven't given Run Wild a chance, well, it's time to do so or be hanged, drawn, and quartered. All right, with that, time to bring this video to an end. Everybody out there, stay safe and keep banging your head.